Il passe au ouais Super bel artiste Super oh, Encore un but sensationnel Norway and France take big steps towards the semi-finals. A draw between Spain and Netherlands ensures that everyone stays in contention in Skopje. Georgina Jakovic pukes in a bin, and we speak to Denmark's Mia Hoyland, all on the latest Uninformed Handball Hour. For the first time in a long time, Myself and Alex are side by side recording. We're just missing Brian Campion, who's still slogging away in Skopje. How you doing, Brian? Hey, boys. I've turned into Alex now, doing all the stuff from from outside of the the group. And now, Alex, you're me. So congratulations on uh, the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> this is so intimate. This is lovely. This is uh, you know we have such a connection in this room. <laughs> yeah, but I, I thought now. Um, that the Montenegro France game will be a bit better than that, to be honest. I mean, it was a good atmosphere and it was tense in parts, but overall quite disappointing, really, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, we or at least we kind of came to the joint conclusion shortly beforehand that it, like it's either going to be the result we saw or Montenegro winning by a goal. And just as I outlined in the last podcast, Montenegro had to phone it in against France. And, uh, well, I don't think they properly phoned it in. I think they they probably would have liked to rest the players a bit more, but uh, that wasn't going to happen uh, either way. Yeah. They just kept going, but they weren't. They were just second best. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I said just before the match started, and it was just France are going to be better in the same way that Norway were just better than Sweden. France are just going to be better than Montenegro. And in this case, they were actually quite a good bit better. Um, and broke Montenegro quite early uh, in the game. And it just, uh, as, as you said, Chris, they should have probably phoned it in. The Rajcevic nearly got injured. The, yeah. There was a scare there uh, with 10 minutes uh, to go, eight goals down, and she pulls up with a knee injury. And here we are thinking, okay, Montenegro are going down to seven players overall, <laughs> and they're not going to last. It was tough. Uh, France played really well. Darlo. Oh. Guys, Cleopatra Darlo. Oh, don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I can't get over it. This is, uh, th- that was the fourth game of the tournament yeah. for her? Still at 50%. You must be very proud, Brian. Very proud. I'm meeting her tomorrow morning, actually, at 9 o'clock. So I'll tell her that, uh, Alex, you're a big fan. I'll just ask her what, what <laughs> if she's going to go. She has I, 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 don't I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm in shock. Uh, she was amazing. 13 saves, 50%. Um, and just yeah, shut down Montenegro before they could even get started. Um, they ran ahead uh, in the first in the first half, France did. Uh, and then just as Montenegro were trying to come back, that's when Darlo just stepped up and shut it down. And it made it, I think, 12-9 at halftime, where yeah. without her, it could have been, you know, 12-11 and a lot more tense. And that... Those big saves allowed France to come out and just, in the second half, and just, you know, run away with it. Uh, the defence was really nice, I think, as well. And Foppa uh, in the centre really impressed me for France because she was just really aggressive in a very controlled way. She was stepping out at the exact right time. She managed to grab a couple of steals mm. just from scaring the Montenegrin players, <laughs> just being there before they could even make a move. And that timing and that uh, precision with her movements was really impressive. Yeah. And, uh, also, where things didn't really fire for them, like with uh, Estelle and Zeminko, you're look, really looking forward to seeing what she was going to be able to do. Didn't quite work for her, but then Orlan Canor with her ridiculous uh, mixture of triple jumping and high jumping <laughs> to just flow through the defense. Uh, that must be quite a sight to see in person yeah it's 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 incredible like you kind of you, you see her doing it it looks like everyone else is wearing concrete conquerors have concrete boots on or something um she's a uh, really really explosive when she does it when she does it right she can have a few random rockets and also a few loose cannons at times but uh when she when she hits that at the, the run at speed and gets the ball there she just looks really unstoppable 
yeah, it's it's like she takes those three steps and jumps at the same time. And then doesn't he have to throw the ball? It's it's like her momentum, her body momentum is Just what go. goes. Yeah, <laughs> that's the shot. And then sometimes she tries to throw the ball and that's when it rockets over because she's got her body momentum and then tries to put her arm into it as well. And then it's just too wild. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, talk to me about, I, I think, because I mentioned it in the intro, we have to talk about it. Uh, Georgina Jalkovic, about what, 25 minutes before throw off. Yeah, so she came out and uh gave me a high five and i was like oh she seems in a good mood or whatever and then she started running around a bit and next thing she hops over the bench almost knocking the whole bench down she's in such a rush and then just starts vomiting in the bin and then uh oh, courtside but everyone seemed courtside so right the bin right beside the delegates or not, <clears throat> right beside the uh the guys the statistic guys and um then there was some Montenegro players who weren't playing who were sitting in the stands and they were like calling everyone over saying basically saying like oh yeah it's happened as in like everyone was well aware of it or something and it turns out afterwards she's been sick for about three days with like a stomach bug thing and has been vomiting a lot so it, pretty incredible how much she played given how sick she was can't have been easy like because a stomach bug like that you really are zapped aren't you from en- of energy yeah and overall her performance was um uh, Two, sh- uh, two goals from eight shots. So, uh, explains a lot, actually. Uh, we were, we were kind of wondering when, when you messaged, we were actually doing the live show, uh, and it just popped up, uh, on my phone and I saw it and we kind of broke host character <laughs> to, to be like, I should have said it. Uh, but we were thinking, you know, is it nerves before a game or something? Uh, but it, it felt like, uh, so if, if it was a stomach bug, it kind of explains a lot. Mm. and explains her performance. I think it was a, a warrior's performance, and at, at times we're like, oh, she seems fine. Uh, <laughs> but I think, obviously, it, it, it wore down on her, and uh, Jokovic is just such an important part of that Montenegro team that, again, if you lose one player, you're down to seven players, and that's what they had today. Yeah. yeah. But all in all, uh, like it's not the end of the world for them. Like I said, this, this, was, this was the game we were looking forward to today, but... It didn't really matter in the end that they lost. Uh, France going pretty damn close now to a spot in the semi-finals. Montenegro still have pretty much the the fate, the destiny in their own hands uh, if they manage to beat Romania in two days' time. And as long as Germany don't pull off a big surprise and beat France, then they're through as well to the semi-finals. So that that could all be wrapped up before the final day in Group Two, and that's pretty much thanks to to a draw in the first game there, Campo, where. It kept both teams' chances alive, but actually also ruined both teams' chances at the same time. Yeah, it's quite incredible to think that Spain were up by six at yeah. one point, and then they snatched the draw at the end. It was just this weird, weird momentum of the game where they seemed more relieved at the end, even though they had been up by six at one stage, and the Dutch were distraught because they obviously were leading right at the end there, and it was it was incredible. Two days behind uh, the Spanish bench, two match days anyway behind the Spanish bench trying to guess which one to go and I went for the Dutch one today and then I picked the wrong one again so disaster <laughs> in terms of that like <laughs> see it seemed like today that Per Johansson was uh calmer than he's ever been in his life it's like he almost knew you were following him <laughs> maybe yeah he knows he knows the cameras are on him now there was one um, time I worry it was actually just sitting down beside the players they're like this is what we're going to do you go here but uh, if it doesn't work it's okay you're just going to pass the ball and we start again I'm like this, what is going on here this is not normal <laughs> who is this who is this <laughs> imposter 29-29 <laughs> in that game um, uh, in the end and we had a, a lively discussion about the last moment so uh, uh, Netherlands were 29-28 uh, up uh, Spain scored a goal to equalize with 20 seconds left which gave Netherlands the ball to uh, get a shot off um, so they, they planned a nice movement Estevan uh had a had, well she had a really uh, I was going to say nice game but then I looked at the stats it looked good but uh, I looked at the stats and she uh, only uh, she had four goals and four assists I read in the official stats she had four goals from nine nine shots mm. so it's kind of a um, she was forced into being a leader in, yeah. but you know she should be the leader 
you know, it's Esteban Apolman. We're not talking about a random young player yeah, stepping up. She, as she says herself, you know, she's getting old. You know, <laughs> old 30. Um, anyway, so she she got, she got had a very good game overall and she was the person making the kind of decisive actions to get Netherlands back into the game or uh, getting them ahead at the right times. Or You know, it, it was really good from her. So she was the player who ended up with the ball uh, at the end, sprinting through uh, between the one and two gap and the Spanish defender stepped across uh, and took a charge, uh, which even though the ball went in uh, after the charge was taken, uh, the referees called it an offensive foul and uh, the game was basically over there. Well, Brian, as a, as a man who has no regard for defence, uh, what what do you think of that last decision? Uh, would you have given it as a goal? Would you just say, ah, play on? Well, I don't know. Her feet are completely planted, though. She does step on across, though, but she... What did you say, Alex, that she thinks she kind of steps into her? No, so I think it was a correct decision. Chris thinks that... Uh... Yeah. Uh, I think the funny thing is, Brian Brian said both, like, it, both are correct. She does step across, but she's also planted. But the whole... Th- but is it too late? The whole thing is that if if you step across and your feet are planted, that you're fine then, aren't you? See that we really need to find a referee to ask this question because I don't think I think the offensive foul the Let charge the game flow lads Let the game flow <laughs> The worst thing about that whole thing was the, uh, the very very last shot like that was like I I don't know uh, Barbosa had Romanian memories in her mind and she was going to absolutely rock at this one and she shows it right at Van der Heide in the face <laughs> she did that right at the end <laughs> <laughs> and then she really runs up to her going oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry and then it was such a feeble shot she's just like yeah, okay whatever <laughs> uh, yeah but yeah I, I, my, my stance is I think at the end of the day uh, with the referees not lo- like in real time it is kind of a, a 50-50 call and they pro- they made the right decision based on the naked eye I think based yeah. on the, and a, a frame by frame maybe it makes it a bit more dodgy but I, yeah, I really, sure. I, I still, I disagree with you, Chris. Uh, you, I think there's the rule in handball is that basically it's so lenient that, that uh, uh, offensive line, uh, offensive foul rule, mm. where again, uh, you know, you plenty of times you see defenders literally being in the air, yeah, that's and wrong, taking though. a charge. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's but it is that's the rule. I think that it should yeah. probably be clarified. I think it's, for example, in basketball, it is much clearer. It's uh, planted when you know there's timing, there's areas, all of that. You think about it from a yeah, you know, a, it's, a split it's second exactly, here, yes, split from seconds. from the 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 yeah. jump. Yeah, the other defender comes in from the other side. It's kind they kind of make this kind of like like I don't know what you call it, like yeah, closing yeah. close like closing doors. So there is a bit of effect of the other the other player coming in like that, kind of closing that that gap too. And she's definitely not planted, you know. But it's not important. It's not important enough to be <laughs> arguing about this for five minutes. It's like the these, like I said at the beginning, both of these but teams I think, are practically out of the competition. No, no, I, th- I think it is. Yeah. It's it's just that it's uh, it's the Netherlands yeah. here. If if we if this was Norway or Denmark mm. or a German team that this happened to, I think this would have been uh, kind of a big news. Yeah, we might see it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> I, I think it's the Netherlands, and uh, they. Basically, have uh, that decision. I mean, that was the difference between them having a chance at the semi final or not. Exactly. I don't want you get to get you too excited now, but I want you to fast forward to the fifteenth of November, okay? At six o'clock. Let's just say, well, twenty past seven, and the final whistle goes. Cristina Niagu scores the winning goal and beats Montenegro, and Romania moved to four points. All right. And then we have uh, Germany up at half past eight. France are kind of uh, have their eye already on the semi final. You know, taking a bit handy. Germany snatch a win. Germany moved to four points. Wouldn't that be unbelievable? Yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, it would be, it would well, be. But we, yeah, I don't know if I want either of those teams in the semi final. I'm going to be honest. No, you don't. But you want the pressure for the last match day. That's all I want. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you want. You do want that. Uh, you just. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know which I want more: an enjoyable last main round day or a good semi final opponent for Norway. I know you want good semi finals, but all you want to do is go down to the last the last match. They can lose their last match then, and France and uh, 
Actually, I don't know who the second team is going to be now. <laughs> <laughs> but like with uh, with the way it's set at the moment and the way it's lined up, it is looking like Montenegro are in quite a good position. It's going to take yeah. uh, something special from Germany, something special from Romania, and those two teams. Although they did produce something special a couple of days ago, I don't think they can. Can they do it again? Keep, keep doing it. Uh, so that group is wrapping up. Um, yeah, who knows. <laughs> um, I, I I don't know though. I mean, when I mean, you think about how the Netherlands did against France, for example, I wouldn't think th- I can't see that Montenegro team beating the Dutch. And how off the pace Montenegro were today against France, I I think I I don't think I'd fancy Montenegro to beat the Netherlands on that last I, match. Though. I don't know. I I would I would tend to ignore that Montenegro France game today. I don't think it's a fully accurate reflection of their ability and their performance um i yeah i i would ignore it i think the game fell apart too, quite early and it was, it was just never going to come back and it wasn't important enough uh for montenegro to drag themselves back into the game i think um netherlands as as well i i think their defense is just all over the place yeah. at times spain really romped through them um the same way that germany romped through them uh the the match day before so there's a lot i th- i still agree it's a really tight game but um you know before we were talking so much about that game being the really crucial one yeah. um but now netherlands have kind of they've put themselves at the mercy of everyone else so it might it might not even get to that point <laughs> exactly all it takes is montenegro to beat romania to yeah. kind of close that up uh, nicely so then let's look then a bit at Group 1 because I think we had one of the clashes that everyone was looking forward to. Norway, Sweden finished 27-25 for Norway. Uh, I got it right in my prediction in my predictor game. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> standing ovation. Standing ovation. Wow, thank you guys. Exact score. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I got a lot of points from it. Anyway, was it 10 points when you get the right score, isn't it? Beautiful. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Our podcast guest, Jenny Carlson, absolutely tore it up with nine goals. A little bit wasteful, but you were, you seemed quite impressed with her, Alex, were you? Yeah, uh, she she really stepped up. And uh, she stepped up after um, her really poor performance in the last game against... Who, who was it? was against Denmark, yeah. Um, she stepped up after her uh, really poor performance against Denmark, where she went zero from four. So she had a real point to prove. And especially in that first half, she was really driving Sweden. When Sweden were in control uh, of the game, and it felt at times that they were the better team. Uh, but Norway have Katrina Lunde. Katrina Lunde. And she is a cheat code. <laughs> and whoever has Katrina Lunde wins the medals and that's <laughs> just the way handball goes and this is getting ridiculous and before the game we were um mm. we were talking about uh, the starting goalkeeper uh, in that game for norway and i was saying it's it's obviously going to be celia Solberg, who has a 49 percent save rate in this tournament and chris pipes up with Oh, it's going to be London. It's, it's going to be London. I don't get 49%, but at this game, Katrina London starts. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and I, I could not <laughs> believe that. I thought it was a ridiculous thing to do, dropping the greatest goal game performance of the tournament. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that's why I am not the coach of the greatest uh, women's handball team ever. Uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, have, we haven't is. been graced with the Katrina Lunda in our teams that we've played for in the past. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but yeah, she, incredible form. She 13 goals, uh, 13 saves, but she... It was, it was much more than that. She was there. Again, it, there's different ways of saving uh, for a goalkeeper. And she was there at the exact right times and making big saves uh, from pretty open chances. And at the end, it, it came down to save when the score was uh, 20, one goal in it. One, one goal yeah, in it yeah. 26 25. Um, Lynn Blum. Uh, had an opportunity on the line. Yeah, he was six from six heading into six that from shot. six, yeah. uh, having a fantastic game, and uh, Katrina Lunde pulled off an incredible save, and that just closed the game. And that uh, I think we, it's worth 
bringing up the, the Yamina Roberts quote as well, or the abridged version of the Yamina Roberts quote that she said uh, after the game when talking about Katrina Lunda. <laughs> she was talking about Katrina Lunda and, of course, their teammates on uh, Vipers Christians and uh, she was speaking to Afton Gladys in Sweden saying that Lunda is more knowledgeable about me than ever. She went in the short corner on all of my shots in the first half. I had no idea I was shooting there. She knew more about me than I knew myself, says Roberts. <laughs> and how do you play against that? <laughs> Uh, that's an unbelievable quote it is yeah it says it says a lot and Roberts was what two from six something like that uh, around around that who still played a really good like handball match but in the shooting uh, department she was second best against Lunda yeah three from eight three from eight five assists though that's why it means that she had a a really good game and one of those assists was something special right Chris oh god yeah we had a so this actually hilariously enough was the first time that Alex sat within like a reasonable distance watching a women's international handball match live. So, because Euro 2020, we were all doing it remotely, this, and seen a lot of club handball, of course, but never an international match. And uh, yeah, first of all, I think you were blown away by the actual, like the dynamism is at a different level live in comparison to TV. But uh, we were at a perfect angle for this a ridiculous cross-court pass from Roberts to Hagman, where Roberts broke through down the left-hand side, realized that she, like she couldn't take the shot, whatever, with the body angle she was in. So she like swerves, whips this uh, this pass cross-court at a, at a curve into the hands of uh, Natalie Hagman. We were sitting right in front of it and could see the curve of the ball, which just looked looked like something we'd never seen before. Definitely, I didn't get any passes like that from you, Brian, out to the right wing in that position. And uh, but Hogman didn't score it. If, I never passed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, yeah, if she'd scored that, it would have been uh, a definite highlight reel. The pass itself is is highlight reel worthy. But probably something you can't really see on TV either. Um, no, it wouldn't you wouldn't see a curve on a pass like that because everything's so flat on TV, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You needed you needed you on the sideline in the perfect position right beside Hagman. That would have been the the shot exactly where we were sitting. But we're like, oh, get that in a HD camera. That's that's what you want. Yeah, <laughs> but a great game of handball as well. Probably in terms of like pure quality between the two teams. Um, like both teams played very well. Both teams mm. gave it the role, and uh, both teams were they were restricted in some ways. No t- no court player had like total dominance over the opposition team everyone is f- made to fight really hard uh but still the the norway's quality just shone through a little bit not just with lunda but also off the top picking up a few goals where she needed to rice up picking up goals where she needed to and uh yeah now we go marching on on the verge of the semi-finals so we said it was going to be the first test for norway the real first test and they they passed it definitely they but did you see any kinks in their armor uh, in that game? You know, something they, they were truly tested. Sweden were in control for a lot of the game and they needed a huge performance from Katrin Lunda. So it's, it wasn't smooth sailing. No. But what, um, anything stand out also, for you? I mean, I think Sweden managed the, like, to con- like in defense to not control them, but to limit them at times as well. Like, as I said, nobody dominated from the Norwegian side. We look at the stats. For the players, uh, you know, Henny Rice that didn't have a perfect game. She had a good game, but didn't not everything went in, and it wasn't just her missing shots, but she was forced into difficult shots, and we saw that throughout the court. Uh, also, the wings maybe not looking as good as they could. That was maybe, you know, it's in, in tighter games like that when you do eventually play the ball out to the wings, and like a team Norway do, uh, then not looking as great as as they could and. Slovenia next for them, then Denmark. They still have two mm-hmm. big tests. It could all come. Could they're not through to the semi final yet? It could all turn around very drastically. Uh, they have to win one of those two games, and uh, they should. But it's not a guarantee, and that's that's good enough for me. Yeah, and Nara Merck was the player that I I, I said was had to be key, and she was uh, two from seven mm. uh, in outfield shots, and yeah, she she was shut down. 
Um, but it, it, even Oftedal and Reisad were also shut down. So Oftedal, until the last five minutes, actually had two from six. Yeah. Henny Reisad had five from nine. So the uh, in the last couple of minutes is when the game opened up and they both got a pair. Both of them got a pair and kind of up their stats. But, you know, all three of Norway's top players were shooting less than 50%. Until that moment, of course, Henny Reisad ended up with uh, seven goals uh, from 11, which is fantastic. You can't discount that finally. Yeah. But there was a, a period where those those stars didn't fully step up. And it won't be every single day that uh, <laughs> Katrina Lunda will Correct. bail them out. Maybe yeah. they'll have to rely on the keeper with 49% save rate. Now probably, because Silly Solberg did make a couple, of, it was 66% yesterday. So she she is probably <laughs> over the 50, 50 Yeah, yeah, she, she did now. come on uh, and save a penalty. So yeah. that pushed her over 50%. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so maybe she'll be given, given a, thrown a bone by Thorir Hergeisen <laughs> at some point in the rest of this championship. <laughs> and uh, Denmark are still in the contest. They've uh, they've had to slog through a couple of uh, tough main round games, and uh, I think the best thing to to do is not hear it from our mouths, but hear it from one of their own players. Uh, Alex and I were down at the Denmark media call to have a chat with their playmaker Mia Hoyland. Let's hear what she had to say. Mia. A nice victory yesterday. I think that's exactly what the team needed after a bit of a tough task a couple of days before that against uh, Hungary. Does it feel like a bit of a relief to to come through that game in that way? Yeah, definitely. Uh, We knew going into this game that Croatia was a tough was going to be a tough game and uh, we have a lot of respect for them. We know that they play different than we're used to in the north. Uh, They just keep on going and uh, even when you think that you've defended them they're just going to go for the chance. Uh, so this victory was such a relief for us and it uh, was important for our team. And they, they caused you a bit of trouble with that aggressive defence. Is there kind of any lessons you take away from, from that game? Well, I think that in the second half, uh, yes, we were a little troubled by their uh, offensive uh, defence. Uh, uh, and I think it took us a minute to just figure out how to, uh, how to handle it. But... Uh, from our latest tournaments, we knew that this was a thing we needed to work on, and I think that we've spent some time uh, in trainings to uh, to find some solutions. So uh, it it took us a while, and uh, in second half, it uh, looked like it was going to be a close game, but uh, luckily we we turned it around and found some solutions. And like for for games like this, and actually a lot of the victories for you in this championship uh, has been based a lot on on the defensive strength, kind of providing the platform for the team and you focus very much as an attacking player in the center of the attack is that how does that feel for you seeing what the likes of Altea and Sandra are doing in goal what the defense is coming up with as well and then uh, giving you the platform to know okay even if things aren't exactly going perfectly we always have that defense well, uh, even though I'm, I'm uh, focused on the attack and not on the defense, I know the importance of uh, the defense. I think that from my point of view, I think that uh, every game is won in the defense. Uh, also for our part, if the defense isn't good, we can struggle a lot to to get the goals and we will use a lot of uh, our strengths for that. Uh, but all almost every game I think that we will win in defense with our goalkeepers and uh, and being close and uh, and tire them with Denmark always you know we talk about it being a team and not kind of individual players but it still feels like every player has a really specific role in the team and a specific job to do during the games so what what is your role in the overall team that's that's also true I think that we as a team have Everyone has talked to Jesper and got their individual jobs for this uh, tournament, and I think that that's what makes us, uh, you know, good because everyone is focused on a small part of their job and not uh, a lot of things they have to focus on. Uh, my talk to Jesper uh, before this tournament was that I had to lay all of my focus and energy in the attack, and uh, I knew going into this that that was where I will have most of my minutes it will be in the attack so I think for me it gives me kind of a relief and I feel relaxed knowing that uh, this is where I have to focus and I don't have to think about everything else 
And does it uh, sometimes with the team, does it feel a little bit frustrating if you know you don't get the opportunity to take you know 10, 12, 14 shots, which you might do at club level to get like really into a rhythm, but here you're really forced to you know single job. Does that feel frustrating at least? Well, uh, I don't think so. I think that we have used a lot of time to uh, get into this flow and understand each of our uh, assignments, if you can say that. Uh, I know that from my uh, from my point of view, when I play in the club, I both I do uh, defense and I attack, and uh, I like to do that. But I know coming here that uh, we have individual qualities and we have to use those. And uh, you know, even though I would be good at defending, my role is in the attack, and I know that. Uh, we do have specific qualities and we have to use them. So I don't think that we will get frustrated if I can't shoot 10 times or if I can't defend because I know that this is what I have to do. It's really interesting also hearing you speak about that. And I remember in the last couple of years since Jesper's come in, like the first European Championship two years ago, he had very little time with everyone before the championship. So he spoke about letting players express themselves. And, and again, last year there was like a development on that. Do you feel over the last couple of years that the team as individuals are able to start expressing themselves in a way, but at the same time have these specific roles that Jesper is giving you? Yeah, of course. I think that uh, since Jesper has come, I think that we have taken small steps in the right direction and I think that as a team you know we're I think that individual there has been space to grow as a player and uh, express ourselves and uh, you know go in and show what qualities we do have as an individual player on the on the field but we also know that uh, as the team that's where we're strongest so I think there's uh, space for both and so you came in to the team in 2016, so that's kind of at the start of the rise of this Danish team where they got to here. And you said it's been kind of incremental, but if you look back to when you joined the team, after having a lot of success and underage level, can you see some kind of big differences from back then to where you are now? Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, even though you say that I came when the success started, I think that I just made, uh, made were there for a couple of years where we struggled a lot and uh, I think uh, instead of saying uh, what differences is made I think that I can just uh, compliment Jesper and say that he uh, came here as a strong uh, strong person and came here with a concept and he was very clear in what which direction we were going to go as a team and as individual players and uh, I think he's just so good at uh, expressing which roles do do you have? Uh, what are your job in uh, in attack and what are your job in defense? And uh, he's just stuck to that concept, and that, that means that every year we can just take a small step and be better and uh, focus on something else because we check something on off of the list. As you said, it wasn't the easiest years at the beginning for you, and that, that seemed to be the case for the Danish women's team for a while. As we can see here at the media call, and every media call is a lot, you probably have the most attention as a national team at this championship and at every women's championship. Uh, but does it feel like the, the relationship with the Danish media has, has improved a little bit as a team in, in recent years? There's always a lot of scrutiny, a lot of expectation, but it seems like almost a little bit more chilled and mutually understanding than it was maybe when you began? Yeah, uh, of course, I think that uh, it comes with better results, that yeah. they are a little easier on us. But still, uh, even even this year, that when we, we've we lost one game against Slovenia, and we know that the media uh, always have a lot of expectations for us. So uh, even though we win a game, we know that there will always be something that we could have done better. And uh, I see that also as a good thing, because we know that the media in Denmark is... Uh, you know, they, they really follow us and they have uh, expectations for us and I only see that as a good thing because uh, there wouldn't be expectations if you haven't earned them. So maybe looking forward to uh, the big game, you have a couple of days to rest now, so that, that must be nice. But uh, it comes down to uh, a big game against Norway and Norway is a team you've actually faced a lot uh, over the last couple of years, especially kind of in the friendly matches. Has playing them more often changed the way you approach them in a tournament? Uh, yes, I think uh, we've come closer and closer to them uh, for each game we've played against them. And I I think that uh, also with our growth as a team that we've come closer. Uh, but <laughs> I know that I think that we haven't won against them in eight years. So uh, we're hungry to win a game against them. Uh, and I know that we've come closer than we've been uh, the last couple of years. And this group is looks like it's going to go right down to the wire. Um, 
regardless of the results in the next couple of days and knowing that you maybe well almost certainly need to get something from that game uh, does that change the approach a little bit going of course you want to win every single game but it is Norway after all but have you already as a team started to talk about how you're going to approach it and how you're going to somehow break them down uh, well luckily we have three days to talk about that but I think that in this tournament uh, luckily for us we've we're in a flow uh, every game hasn't been easy and we've almost every game we, we've known if we don't win this game uh, we wouldn't succeed in this tournament. So I think that uh, somehow it uh, turns out to be a good thing for us uh, because we're, we're now used to uh, you know, knowing that it will be a tough game uh, going into this. And playing against Norway, we always want to win, uh, no, matter, no matter what. We have one more question to ask. This is like an underlying theme for this championship on empowering women. And uh, as a player, I wonder, what is, how do you interpret that for yourself? and in the context of being a player at this championship? Uh, I always love that theme, uh, and especially in a tournament like this where I, th- I feel like uh, every woman going on the field, every, every woman being uh, in here is empowered, and I think it's a strong signal to send that uh, we do have female judges, we do have strong uh, female players who want to fight, and uh, I, think, uh, I think it's a good signal to send. Lovely. Thank you so much, Mia. Thank you. Thank you to Mia Hoyland. Of course, Denmark have done what they had to do and now set up uh, for a really big big game against Norway. No matter what, in reality, and they just need to beat Norway. <laughs> See, <laughs> simple as that. You believe Slovenia will lose to Norway, and then, uh, then they have it in their own hands. Yeah, uh, some really interesting games coming up in the next couple of days. We are going to be back with you for the next podcast right before the final round of matches where it's an absolute bumper day on Wednesday with uh, all 12 teams in action. Hopefully, well, almost certainly still some semi-final spots to play for. And uh, yeah, hopefully another shock or two. And hopefully Brian won't see any more puke pre-match. <laughs> is, that your, is that your wish now before you join us on Thursday? No more puke? Yeah, I think that's a pretty clear message. That's a low bar, but... Uh, that's where we're at at the moment at this stage of the championship. <laughs> Not long until you're here with us, Brian, <laughs> in Ljubljana. And finally, we get the three of us together again. But until then, thank you, everyone, for listening, and goodbye. Goodbye.